You are listening to the Get Global Podcast, a weekly journey into the international business landscape with leaders, knowers, and doers from around the world who share their stories and insights on the issues that matter most. Get Global brings you the best to help you thrive in foreign markets. This week, we have with us Nick Fries, the CEO and founder of Digiday, the leading online media publication launched in 2008. Uh, they now have offices in London and Tokyo and have uh, also launched Glossy in 2016, which focuses on the fashion business. And uh, Nick, please do tell us a little bit more about uh, Digiday yourself and anything else you've got going on at the moment. Sure. Thank you, Julian. Thanks for having me on. And yes, we do. And we um, actually launched another brand, too, called Tearsheet, which is a, a brand about um, how money is being modernized and how fintech is changing the way that we bank, to the way that we manage our um, finances, uh, to the way that we deal with loans, and, and much more. So, you know, as a whole, Digiday is a media company that focuses in on the transformation of industries and how technology is leading those 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 changes. So we dive into media marketing, we dive into fashion, luxury, beauty, retail, and then we also dive into finance as well. And so the Digiday Media, um, the Digiday brand is, is a global brand. And so the, the next step for us is actually taking the Glossy and the Tearsheet brand uh, into more of, of a global footprint. Very exciting. And what, at what point did you start to understand that the international dimension in particular is interesting uh, and important for Digiday and your other brands that you're, that you're building? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, being a global media company was always a part of our, our mission. And I think what happened was we started to take a look at the traffic patterns for Digiday, digiday.com, our media marketing title. And we saw that a high percentage of our audience was actually international. And so, and without doing any, you know, marketing or promotion or uh, audience development, um, you know, around the world, people were just coming to us because they were interested in what was happening, um, how, how digital was changing media marketing. And, you know, the U.S. is such, is the biggest market. Um, so we just started getting people coming in from, from Europe and the UK, um, in APAC and, and, in LATAM. And so we thought to ourselves, well, um, we need to start making some moves and start expanding our, our influence. And so we, uh, it was about four, four years ago, we launched our, our UK office. And so that was your first step abroad, correct? It, it was. And, you know, I mean, initially we thought that we were going to move into APAC and, you know, we'd launch in Singapore or, you know, Shanghai or, or, or but it just became too much of a leap for us. So we thought to ourselves, we need to, we don't want, you know, a huge language barrier. Um, we want to be able to, you know, be able to manage the, the team, uh, you know, just basically on a, on a plane flight that was only five hours instead of, you know, uh, 24 hours. And so we decided we would start with London. Excellent. So what were some of the uh, first experiences that you had that you didn't really expect? Well, I think the first thing is um, how long it took, you know, to actually establish ourselves, to establish a business, to um, hire a great team, um, to start really driving revenue and also how much it would cost for us to build the business just as, you know, a launching pad in, in England. Um, and so our London office, you know, primarily handles, um, you know, uh, EMEA. And so that, that really is the, you know, sort of the, the beachhead for us. And, uh, I thought that we could just find good people and we would be up and running and within a year or two, um, we would be we would be flying because our brand was very strong here in the U.S. And I just thought, you know, if we can be strong here, we could be strong there. And you know, I don't know if that was you know naivete or arrogance or um, probably yeah, maybe a little bit of both, I mm -hmm. guess. And um, so a friend of mine who had a um, had a business ha has a business here in the U.S. and also 
uh, has a business in England, uh, which he had shut down. He said to me, you know, everything is going to take you twice as long and it's going to be twice as expensive as you think it's going to be um, to build the business there. He said, you may want to really think about it and, and reconsider. And But I was just, you know, I just said, well, he's in a different business and, you know, I know media, I don't know retail, but uh, I know we can make it work there. But what we found out is that it was actually took four times as long and it was four times as expensive to get the business going there. But now, after all the time and after all the investment, um, our European business is our fastest growing area of digital media. I mean, it's it's absolutely blowing up. And uh, so it's it's great to see. It's just you have to have that that stick to it ofness. Um, you know, when you're, you know, um, launching a international business. So in your opinion, in what you're seeing is that the, uh, the sweat was worth it. Mm -hmm. It it definitely was. And like, it was, it was a, a combination of things. Um, it was finding the right people. Um, it was getting established. It was getting brand recognition. And, you know, when you're building a media company, um, you know, which is a little bit different than a technology company because media companies, they, they take the quality media companies take a long time to build. There is no quick path. There is no fast fix to building an audience and to build a quality brand and connection with an audience. So, um, you know, it, it definitely took a little bit longer, but it was absolutely worth uh, the time and the investment. So those were the kinds of things that were adding up the time and the expense along the way was finding the right people and building the audience the right way. Were there any other things that perhaps were surprising that took, that took a long time? Um, I, you know, I think just, just establishing, you know, the, even the little things like, uh, the employee contracts and having a, a different handbook, um, that, you know, fit the uh, UK employment laws. And, um, you know, th those things take time. And, and, you know, you have to pay attention to it, to dealing with uh, the tax situation. Um, you know, all those things are d definitely, um, you know, you, you need your attention. And so um, you want to just be able to just jump into the business and manage the business. But that is that is a big piece of it as well. Yeah. So then you turned around soon after that and went off to Tokyo. Um, how long How long between the two did, did it take for you to uh, sort of get London squared away and then go to Tokyo? Well, we actually did it simultaneously. And oh, you did? We, we did. And uh, we, were, we were very fortunate because actually the Digiday Japan is a licensing agreement that we have with Infobon. Infobon is a media company and a technology company. They've got a number of consumer um, brands, and they also um, handle Business Insider. They were handling Gizmodo. They were doing licensing deals with those brands. And um, the CEO of that company approached us at one of our international events. That we had an event in Barcelona and asked us if she could take Digiday to Japan. And you know, at the time, I didn't think it would matter all that much because we were so focused in on Europe. Um, but she was so persistent and she had such a great reputation um, with the Gawker properties and um, was also working on Business Insider. So we thought, what do we have to lose? Let's do it. And um, they have been an unbelievable partner. I mean, that is the thing. If you're going to do a licensing deal, you've got to make sure you've got rock solid partners. So um, they have cared for the brand. They, they, they feel a sense of ownership over it. Um, everything from the design to the way that they create content there to the way that they run events, it, it really feels like uh, they are truly a part of uh, Digiday HQ. Um, it's, it's remarkable. So, uh, and we're, we're having a lot of success there too because there was a seam in the, in the market in, in Tokyo where there had you know, been some traditional uh, trade and marketing um, publications, but there wasn't anything like Digiday. And so, um, they've done a fantastic job and it's, uh, it's paying off. So now that you've got those two, uh, anything else on the horizon, perhaps, uh, the rest of Asia pack or are you, are you, it does. So do you do anything in the rest of Asia Pacific from Tokyo or is the Tokyo office exclusively focused on Tokyo? 
Well, we're yes, we're we actually are expanding into Australia. We've got a partnership, another licensing agreement that we've entered into, and we're doing our first um, Digiday event in Australia in in a month. And so we're doing that with um, you know the, the leading association in Australia for media and marketing, and um, so they're taking our brand there, and we're starting with events, and then we're going to roll it into uh, content publishing, paid paid media, uh, and more. So we find that. At least with, you know, Japan, we've had su- such success because, you know, we've had great partner. It's so far away. Um, you know, there's certain sensibilities and language barriers that you have to get right in order to be successful. And uh, for us, licensing is really the only way to do it. And, you know, not having, you know, a lot of knowledge of um, of Australia and, and the Australian media marketing uh, industry or market um, to work with the leading association there. Uh, to work together on launching the Digiday brand, I think is is a, a nice test for us, and so so we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, for for us, it, it, anything that goes, I think, beyond Europe right now, we're we're looking at licensing deals. So, um, you know, we we're, we've done some work in Germany uh, with another media company um, that we're going to continue to explore. But um, you know, again, with licensing deals, if you have a fantastic partner. Um, you know, you can really scale and grow the business. If if you have a difficult partnership where they don't understand your brand or they don't have the same sensibilities, the same drive, you're just not going to reach the, I think the the success that uh, that you would envision. So, looking at yourself from uh, the pers- as as a a player in a uh, large space that seems to only be growing. What do you feel is the international story for media brands right now? Uh, you've got a lot of uh, major uh, contenders here in the United States that are um, aggressively seeking audiences outside the United States uh, in mm-hmm. the markets that you're talking about in different verticals. Um, what do you think they're after and uh, what do you think they're doing right and what do you think they're doing wrong? What, what are some of the pieces of uh, feedback and um, uh, concern that you're hearing from them or opportunity? What's the word on the street? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think that the first thing for media companies today, it's about survival, right? Um, because uh, you can't survive just on display advertising. I think all media companies, that, that was the original dream. Oh, we can just run banners everywhere. We can run video. We can run mobile. Um, we can run sponsored content. But you know, as a media company today, you have to do a lot more than that. I mean, diversity is um, what will keep you whole and will keep you growing. And so if you look at any major media company today, everyone is racing towards um, a diverse revenue set. And so for us, you know, we have about nine to 10 different ways that we make money, everything from advertising all the way to paid content, licensing, you know, events and, and more in between. And so if you look at, um, you know, other media companies, they're, they're trying to do the same thing. I mean, New York Times is just a, a stellar example of, of a media company that has made a transition, you know, from print to digital, from advertising native content to paid digital content. And um, they are a real model, I think, for any, any media company today um, where they have diversification, they have high quality journalism, um, they have uh, paid content. I mean, they've just done a fantastic job to um, – you know, companies like you, know, you take a look at, at The Guardian, um, who, you know, came to the U.S. And, and launched their business here and wanted, you know, that to be a part of their growth. And, you know, um, you know, I know the person who helped build that. And, you know, he grew it to become a break even, almost profitable business by a diverse revenue model. Um, but they were having such challenges back, you know, back in the U.K., um, and they were bleeding so much cash, they had to pull back. So they they actually had to pull away from what was working. So, um, and why? Because you know they had such overhead. They um, they were too reliant on display advertising. They didn't have enough paid media. And um, you know, so I think those are some of the things that media companies are thinking about today. And then the other thing, you know, media companies you know, globally just got hooked on Facebook traffic. And, you know, they were playing the scale game. And I think what media companies are realizing is that, you know, Facebook, um, they, 
they really are not a media company's friend. You know, you, you can't grow on the benevolence of a platform. And that's what's been happening for so many years. And um, now they're starting to turn off that traffic. And so we just ran a story today about how media companies now have to pay for uh, traffic getting to their sites. If they've got branded content that they're running, um, they have to pay more for that to drive that traffic when that traffic used to just come organically. Um, I mean, we always saw that coming. I mean, just, you know, that, that benevolence was not going to happen forever. So, um, I think that's also a challenge. So you've got, you know, the, the challenge of scale with banner advertising versus audience growth and, um, you know, all the reliance on, uh, on Facebook. And so I think that, um, you know, media companies today really need to double down on, I, we think the first thing is quality, quality of brand, quality of content and journalism. And once you do that and you get an engaged, loyal audience, then you can monetize that and you can do that in, in multiple ways. And so one is obviously paid media. The other, you can do events, um, you can do licensing deals and you, know, you can do e-commerce. Um, you know, there's a lot that you can bake in and, and build a great media company. But so many new media companies and even traditional media companies um, just had these big eyes and thought, okay, we can just go with scale and we can go with lots of ad deals and lots of ad placements and uh, we're just going to focus on that when all of a sudden, boom, that that balloon just popped and um, you know they floated back down to earth and now are scrambling to build their businesses. And this is, this is a global situation. This is not just here in the U.S. So do you... What, what other kinds of ways do you think that they're going to um, fill that gap? Uh, obviously, focusing on quality seems to be um, your suggestion. What kind of mistakes do you think people are likely to make? Or uh, uh, what, what kind of interesting, innovative ways of, of you know, replacing Facebook will we start to see? Yeah, I think, um, I think the first thing is that media companies need to figure out and not all can do this, but I think quality um, media companies can. What is your paid media strategy? How can you get this completely pure relationship with your reader uh, and the value exchanges? I will pay you for your content. And in return, obviously, we will give you thought-provoking, insightful, deep journalism um, that, you can, that you can read. Um, I think that's a, that's really important for media companies and you know it's it's a key strategy for us um and you look at so many news organizations as well as other consumer titles and business titles that are trying to figure out what their paid play is going to be so that's number one number two is once you have that that audience and a loyal engaged audience you can help brands tell stories through that platform so I think, you know, setting up agencies, content agencies. So, you know, Vice built its whole business on, you know, its, its agency that was built right into the media company. And so that's how they got to become such a giant, such a media giant. Um, you know, they taking, you know, Budweiser as a client from $50,000 to, you know, a, a $5 million to, you know, a $50 million client. It's, it, that's, that's how you do it. And, um, so I think content agencies that are built in, that in these content agencies that um, know the sensibilities of the brand, the sensibilities of the ed editorial, um, you know, as well as understand the audience and can help their clients connect uh, to those audiences in meaningful ways. So that's certainly another important area. Um, you know, e-commerce. E-commerce is also another bright spot for, for media companies. Um, you know, you see media companies like, and for example, uh, Perch, which is um, the media company that focuses in on, on the tech space. I mean, they do a gigantic business. They're, you know, $100 million plus uh, media company, and a big portion of that comes from uh, their commerce business. So I think that's another area that, that publishers can, can plug into. So there are bright spots, a lot of bright spots, um, but uh, again, it has to be diversity. And, uh, you know, you have to be very strategic about that and you can't go willy nilly, um, into trying all sorts of new things. Not that you, you know, you, you have to try new things, but, 
um, you have to be smart about it. And, uh, the, you know, again, social is not going to solve your problems. If you saw yesterday, Vox announced that they laid off 50 people because, you know, their social video plays were not panning out for them. And again, it's very, very difficult to make money on on social video or, um, you know, anything that has to do with the platforms right now. Speaking more about uh, video, what do you think is going on with OTT and SVOD? Um, what is the next two to three years looking like for that internationally? Well, that's, that's a great question. We actually just um, about six months ago uh, created a conference to focus just on that. It's called the Video Anywhere Summit, and that is going to happen um, in a few months from now. And so we're going to be diving into that. So I, I, I'm very interested to see what it's going to be like in Europe. I, you know, I, I don't know uh, the European market as well as we know, uh, as I personally know the U.S. market, uh, which everybody is racing to figure out. We just had an event last week, uh, the future of TV. And OTT is uh, the front and center of whether you're a, a publisher, a media company, um, or you're a network. You're, you're trying to figure it out because, again, look, that, that is the future. Um, it's going to be screens everywhere, and it's not going to be just you know attached to a cable box inside your home. Um, you know, you're going to be on a plane. You're going to be uh, at your kid's soccer game. Um, you know, you are going to be just – basically video anywhere and so if you're a media company that doesn't have that as a key part of your strategy um you know i think it's going to be a bleak future and last question before we go um what are brands making of all of this uh brands that are focused on the international domain uh planning out their their uh, media strategies and uh, how they'd like to engage their audiences abroad or, or their targets uh what what's the word on the street with them? Well, I think brands, you know, they're 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 concerned about, you know, they talk a lot about brand safety. I mean, that's a it's a big concern for for most brands today. Um, you know, there's there's not as much transparency as they would like, though. You know, their actions most of the times um, are don't sync up with that. Uh, so they continue to spend, you know across the whether whether they spend on YouTube whether they spend on Facebook um, and you know their ads appear in content that they probably would not like them appear to appear in but I think that um, you know brands the brand safety is is, is going to be a concern no matter where you are um, I think in in, in Europe uh, GDPR is going to have an impact um, you know and so we'll see what that's going to be like if that's going to be a y2k um, situation, or it's going to have a real impact on on media companies, on tech companies, as well as its marketers. So, um, but you know, I think the opportunity for brands today, whether you're here in the U.S. or you're global, is that you can develop, you know, a connection uh, with your, uh, you know, with your customers, and it can be direct. You don't have to have a network. Um, you can collect their email address. You can have them come to your site. They can be connected to your Facebook group. They um, have many ways that they can connect to to your story. And um, it's an amazing time for brands. They can disintermediate themselves from you know media companies and um, networks, and uh, they can start to do things on their own. I mean, I think you can take a look at some brands who have done an unbelievable job with with content. I mean, you know, the obvious ones are you know like like Red Bull and and what they do around around video and, and, and social video and um, how they tell their stories. So. Um, you know, although brands have a lot of challenges and there's all sorts of fragmentation and there's all sorts of trust issues and, and concerns around that, um, they also have this amazing opportunity now to control the conversation they have with their with their customers. It's, it's, it's a great thing. Excellent. Well, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your story and for uh, the insights as well. Um, hopefully we'll have you back real soon. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more about our events and get more global intel every week, sign up for our newsletter at getglobal.co.